to help in some way, let Marlene know, because I'm sure there's things on our list that didn't get done, that we always need help. And if you want to help with spring deep cleaning inside the building, let us know, because I always notice things that are dirty and broken. So, well, my name is Mary, for those of you who don't know me. And last weekend, we celebrated Good Friday and then Easter. And, you know, I don't know why Good Friday and Easter, I don't even like to call it Easter, but that's a whole other sermon that we're not going to get into today, Resurrection Sunday, um, always, like, pulls on my heart, always makes me, like, think about things, always makes me, like, ponder. And this year, I think it really kind of hit me. So I want to talk about the cross. That's why I, like, dragged it over here right in the middle. For all of you that didn't get to see the handsome man on the guitar, I apologize because I know the cross was kind of in his way. But I remember being in, like, the grocery store one time and said something to somebody about being Good Friday. And this person looked at me and said, it's not Good Friday, it's you know, horrible, dark, black Friday, the day they killed my Savior. And I just, like, looked at her and thought, now isn't the time to preach, Mary. I don't know what I said. I'm sure I said something. I'm sure I did. But it really got to me. And, and like, so now every Easter, every Good Friday, I always come back to that, and I want to talk to you guys about the cross because I find it so interesting that the cross now represents Christianity. Now, for most of us today, we look at the cross and we just think of being saved from our sins or just being a Christian, and, like, we don't get it, right? Like, I mean, I know of young men that wear a cross necklace you know, and I'll start talking to them, and, and they really don't know the Lord, but they know that they're a Christian, and that, that cross represents Christ. I mean, I talked with a young person not very long ago, and the person they were with said, Pastor Mary, you need to talk to so-and-so. And I said, oh, hi, what's going on? And the person they were with that called me over said, you know, they don't know if they believe in God or not. And I was just like, oh, okay, you know, so I start kind of going over some basics. And they stopped me at one point, and they said, well, I want to get baptized. I know I'm going to get baptized. I just don't know, you know, if God, you know. Like, they don't know if God is real. They don't know if Jesus is the Savior. But they know they want it. I got to get baptized before I die, right? And I'm sitting there going, okay, we are living in a day and age in a society where the cross represents Christianity. That's all we know that we need to be water baptized, and most of us are living hell on earth until we die, and then we'll go to heaven when we die. And I know I'm not making any sense right now, but I'm trying to get you all to the point of understanding what this cross actually is. If you watch a movie and it's the Middle Ages and you see some guy's been off to war, he's been wherever, and he's walking up to his village and outside of the village are gallows and there's people that are dead hanging on the gallows, you instantly know, okay, something bad is happening in his village, right? When all of a sudden he's like, what is this, right? If you were to watch a movie back, like, based in David and Goliath time, and you were to walk up to a village and you would see spikes with people's heads on it, the the guys would be like, oh, my gosh, we've been conquered. What am I talking about here? So throughout history, invaders come to a land, and they kill, they invade, but that's not enough. They've got to put along the entrance, along the road to that village, a symbol of them conquering. Okay, so like if we did modern day and age, you know, like when you, when you see the photos of like when the Nazis came through and killed all the Jews, you see piles of dead bodies, right? 
And so that, what does that represent? That represents the ultimate betrayal of humanity, of taking somebody's life, of killing them. But now, when somebody dies on the gallows, what do I mean by the gallows? When they get hung, they instantly die. At least they should die within a minute or two because you're suffocating. When somebody has their head cut off and their head's put on a stake, that's, that's much more instant. Um, when you see, like, the shooting, where, what do they call that? The squad line, what is that? When they, the firing squad, when they have to go there. Hopefully that's pretty instant, right? And we are so far removed from the Romans that we don't understand what the cross represented. The cross did not represent salvation. The cross did not represent this movement that's full of love. The cross represented torture and dominion and total, total devastation of your freedom. The cross was unique to the Romans. And the Romans, right, were based out of Rome. They began to expand. And as they would go into town and village and land, and they would take over, they would take the people out, the soldiers and those in charge, and they would put them on a cross. They would nail their hands, nail their feet, and they would let them hang there for days as they slowly died. There have been accounts of the Romans for like miles and miles of the roads going into some certain areas where there would be every so many yards a cross placed with somebody from that town hung on it. When you would go into a town and you would see all the crosses lining the road going up, you would know that those were oppressed people. Those were people that did not have the freedom to do what they wanted, to make decisions what they wanted, that the Romans had come in, they had taken people of importance or people of whoever that they wanted to show off to everybody, and they put them on these crosses and they tortured them. Everybody knew in the entire world at that time, I don't know how far into Asia they got, but in the majority of the land where they had people that interacted with each other, the cross represented death, horror, torture, and dominion of someone else over them. It did not represent love. It did not represent Christianity at all. So we at the Great Lakes Dream Center had helped out with the kids on Good Friday at the community worship service, and I was getting together some coloring sheets. And I kept looking for the different sheets, and I would find sheets with Jesus hanging on the cross. And I know it was Good Friday, but what the point I wanted to make to the kids was is that he came down off the cross and he rose again, and I was looking for coloring sheets of an empty grave. And, you know, when I finally got one, I realized how simple that symbol was, right? You know, it's kind of a half circle, with another half circle, and then a circle, right? It's like a cave, open, empty, with a circle of the rock that was rolled over. And I thought, that's not that complicated. Why wasn't the open grave the symbol of Christianity? How come when they cleaned out Pompeii and they found a marking on the back of the wall behind a dresser, how come it wasn't an open grave? Why was the symbol the cross? Especially at a time, Pompeii happened about 70 AD, and the Romans still had a lot of control over land. They knew the cross represented death and humiliation and oppression. But yet the Christians still used the cross as their symbol. Now that's what I want to talk about. 
we can go through something horrible. We can have the enemy come into our lives and totally put to death whatever hope and whatever dream you might have had, totally torture you through the process of it, totally take all your control away while you're going through it, and it can still be a triumph. A trauma can become a triumph. Now, that's, that's hard for us to comprehend, but it all depends on who helps you through it and who you are leaning on when you get on the other side of it. In Acts chapter 2, we see this is about the day of Pentecost. I think it was maybe 40 days to 50 days from the time that, that Christ had come. And it says here in Acts chapter 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a cr crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galatians? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthenons, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cassaponia, Pontus and Asia, Phyrega and Famlichia, and Egypt, and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language, our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God will pour out, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoke, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then he continues to go on and talk to them about David and, and a lot of the things that the prophets had said about the Messiah coming. So these Jewish men, again, are seeing a sign. Speaking in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. You know. And so here... They were, they don't believe in Christ. They know what's happened with Christ because it was a, a national thing. It happened right there, Passover weekend. And he reminds them, you nailed him to the cross. You, along with evil men, nailed him to the cross. What is he saying? You did the worst thing that our culture can do to somebody. You didn't try to cut off his head. You didn't hang him on a gallow. You didn't drown him. It wasn't over with quick. You did the worst thing possible. You did the thing that our enemies do to us when they come in and they take over and they 
put us under control. You, along with them, did this despicable, horrible thing. You guys think that the tax collectors are awful for taking your money. You worked with the Romans to do the worst thing possible to a man that you knew did miracles. He says, he was accredited by even you of the miracles he did. You knew he was from of God, and yet you did the worst thing possible. But what was supposed to be trauma turned to triumph because despite what they did to him, death couldn't hold him. It says that, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You know, we all know that Jesus had told the disciples ahead of time that, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die and three days later I'm going to rise again. They'd be like, no, 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 no. He's like, yeah, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. He knew. We knew he knew. We know that. But then yet, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he was going, he was in there praying, crying out to God and saying, if you can take this cup from me, please do it. And he's pleading with God. He's trying to get the disciples to stay up with him and pray. Why? Because he knew that he had to go through everything as a human being and feel everything that he was going to go through. And he said, if there's any other way, hey, I'm here. I want to be the sacrifice. Is there any other way than the cross, please? Why? Because the cross was the most painful and torturous way. The Romans had plenty of time to try out other methods. And this was the method that they used. It wasn't an easy method. They, I mean, you'd have to go, you'd have to cut down a tree, you'd have to get lumber as tall, at least, you know, a little bit taller than the guy, you'd have to hew it, you'd have to put it together, you'd have to do... I mean, you have to dig a hole, you have to put it down in there and get it secured so it's not going to flop all over. They did this. They went through all that effort time and time again and village and village and town and town and country and country because they knew this was the worst way. And they knew that nobody's going to come back and try to fight against them because the fear of them having to get hung on the cross. This was a way of manipulation and of control. Jesus didn't even want to go through with it. But he was willing and obedient. Why was it so important that our Savior and our God had the worst punishment possible known on earth? You know, have you ever thought of that? Like, you know, I mean, when they, when they would sacrifice a lamb or an ox or whatever for our sins, they just would slit their neck and they'd bleed out pretty quick. I mean, why couldn't they have just had Judas walk up to him and say, how dare you whatever, and take a knife and just slit his neck, and he just, the blood would be shed, and he would just fall down, and that'd be the end of it. Why did Pilate have to go and whip him 39 times? You know why they did it 39 times and not 40? Because they had done it so many times that they knew if they whipped somebody 40 times, they would die. But if you did it 39, there was a, they, were, they knew how to kill. They knew how to torture. They knew how to make your life miserable. Pilate, many people believe, had him whipped and beat and then brought, and so that way when the officials would see how pathetic he looked, that they would spare his life, they would say, okay, he's been punished enough, we don't think he'll continue with what he's doing. And they said, no, we still want him killed. Normally, men didn't have the beating and the whipping and then go on the cross, because they would have to carry their cross to where they were going. Remember Jesus, he fell down, he couldn't carry it because he had been whipped. And so instead, they had to find Simon, one of the, somebody that was traveling through, and he had to carry that cross for Jesus to get it up to the place where they would go. So he not only had the worst death possible, he had the worst torture before he had that death. The reason why he went through all of that was so that way he was carrying our sins, and so when we go stand before him, 
and right judgment comes well you did this this and this this is what your punishment would be jesus said i've been through it i've been through it i have had the worst death possible i've had the worst torture possible i've had the worst pain possible he took on the punishment that we deserved now some of us you know don't believe that well i you know I stole some gum when I was nine years old, that the punishment would be equal to that. Of course, right? Of course not. Like, as a society, we don't punish everybody the same. But if somebody were to, you know, go into a bank and, you know, rob them and sexually assault people and, you know, torture everybody and kill them, we might look at that person and say, okay, your punishment is a lot greater than the nine-year-old who stole the gum. And Jesus took on the punishment, the greatest, the biggest, the deepest, the worst punishments that were doling out at that time. And probably, I mean, to torture someone in the type of death they had for as long as they would go through that torture, he went through it. He went through a lot of that. But that cross even though it was still being used to oppress people, did not continue to represent that. This cross was used all over to torment people. But yet, after the Romans fell, after they had come and gone, the cross continues to represent Christianity. What Satan tried to do on the cross was humiliate Christ. What Satan tried to do with, by putting Jesus on the cross was to try to oppress. What Satan tried to do with the cross was to try to put us into being afraid, into being, into being you know, controlled and manipulated, and now I can't speak out because what if I end up on the cross? Because what Jesus did on the cross was something that he wanted to happen. He wanted to take on our sin. It's interesting because we know the word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But yet, in the midst of Christ being on the cross, what did he say? He said, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and for some people, it might be kind of confusing to say, like, well, why did God leave him while he was on the cross? I thought God will never leave us nor forsake us. He will never leave us nor forsake us now because of what Christ did on the cross. Jesus was willing to be forsaken by God and to take on all of the sin. And in that moment when he was taken on all of that sin, he was not in the presence of God. He was in the presence of all of that sin. He took that on himself while he was on the cross. I'm so glad that they recorded that he said that because we know that sin can separate us from Christ. And so it separated him temporarily as he took it all on. And he said, that is it. He said he, he released his spirit to go. And he willingly died. He goes down to hell. He faces Satan and says, this is enough. You no longer have these keys where you can lock people up because they sinned. You're no longer the jail keeper over souls. He takes those keys of death in hell, and he comes back, and he is ro risen again, right? And it was interesting because when he first came back and he was in the garden, one of the women that had gone, she wanted to go, and she started to kneel down at his feet, and she's about to touch him, and he says, don't touch me. He's like, because he wanted to go and become clean, to let go of all of that sin that had been put on him and everything that he encountered with the hell. He goes, he gets all cleaned up, and then he begins talking to the disciples. He begins showing up at different places. When, by the time he saw Thomas, he says, go ahead and put your hand on my side. Go ahead and touch the holes that are in me. Why? Because now he's clean. What he did, he finished. He finished that. It was accomplished. So now when we go to the cross, it represents triumph. It doesn't represent the torture and the manipulation. Because, see, Satan will try to put the torture and the manipulation on a situation. But when we turn it over to Christ, he can take, you know, what man meant for evil, and he can make it into something good. 
And so now when we look at that, we say it once represented death. But our God was willing to go to that cross to die for us. He took on that sin. So now I can stand here, and even though I am a sinner, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I never have to leave the presence of God because Christ took that on. So what was meant to be trauma has turned into triumph. And what the cross represented to people all across the world, maybe their father was put on a cross, maybe their uncles had been put on a cross, maybe they lived in Germany and they had seen those crosses in their village. Now all of a sudden a Christian comes through and they're wearing a cross. And they're like, why do you have a cross on? That is like the worst, horriblest thing ever. We had the Romans in here, and they put our loved ones on the crosses. My grandfather was on the cross. Why are you wearing a cross? Let me tell you who else they put on the cross. Let me tell you who went to the cross and came down, and you know what? Death couldn't hold him, and he rose again, and the sins that we've committed put him on that cross. Let me tell you about the triumph of the cross. Yes, the Romans came into your town and people died, but the Romans tried to take God and say that they were greater and stronger than even him, and guess what? They weren't. Let me tell you about the triumph of Jesus on that cross. And those Christians continued to use the symbol of the cross wherever they went, wherever they would gather to worship, they would put a cross up. I mean, we go everywhere, right? We see a cross on the wall. We put the crosses in our grave. Why? Because the grave cannot hold them. Why? Because the cross is over them. They are a Christian. They are not staying in there. They are going to be risen again. We want the cross to represent who we are wherever we may go. Why do I have young men wearing the cross when they don't even know for sure who Jesus is? Because they know, I'm not perfect. And I know that cross means that I can be saved even when I sin, so I'm going to wear it, man. Why does Hollywood have some scared priest running around with a cross? Because maybe there's no power in that priest, but there's power in the cross. And that's universal. And people know that that cross no longer represents trauma. The cross represents triumph. Now, you know, some people want to remember that Jesus was actually on it, and you see some symbols of the cross with Christ hanging on it. You have other people that have the cross by itself to say, you know, he was on there, but he came back down, and this represents what he did for us. Either way you look at it, the cross is still reminding us of what he did and what he went through and what he was willing to go through and what he overcame. Now, we can go through situations and be reminded of the trauma of it. In the midst of that, there was, there was nothing good, right? There was nothing happening. It wasn't like an angel came down in the middle of his time on the cross and, and covered him and comforted him and gave him a hug and, and, and put, you know, honey in his mouth and he was able to feel better while he was on the cross. It wasn't. He was on the cross, tortured the entire time. He came down off of the cross dead. He was, even in death, they still stuck up a spear up inside of him and burst the sack that was around either his heart or his lungs and fluid came out. So even after he's dead on the cross, they were still torturing him. It was, like I said, it wasn't until we see the gravestone, it was rolled away. It says there was like an earthquake and the angels came down and they rolled it away and he wasn't in there. There was bright lights. Jesus is now in the garden talking to the ladies. But, but we don't walk around with empty graves around our neck. We don't make the symbol on the walls as we go through of, of an empty cave with a, with a rock next to it. Because even though that's where the, we could say that's where the triumph happened is when he was risen again, 
we remember what he did on the cross and we've changed the story behind what the cross represents no more did the cross represent death and agony and torture now the cross represents this is your way to freedom your way to freedom is because of what christ did on that cross the christians could have walked around for years afterwards and had their focus be on how horrible it was but instead you know, just as Peter's explaining it, he said to him, he says, you guys, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, about the Messiah coming, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of light. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Christ, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. When they heard the message of what Jesus went through on the cross and then was risen again, and were reminded of what the prophets said about that, they repented. They were water baptized. They received the Holy Spirit baptism, filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were born again, right? They had a newness of life. They said, this was our old life. This is what we believed. Now we're going to go and be born of this life. And the cross became triumph and not trauma. Now, the Christians took the symbol of what represented evil and hate and dominion, and they began to use that as a symbol to say, look, Satan, was, you, you put your best shot out here, and guess what? We, we triumphed that. You know, it'd be, like, it'd be interesting, like, you could say, like, oh, hey, we went to war with Canada, and they tried to use paintball guns on us. And we won the pink ball tournament. Woohoo! They tried their best, but we are better than Canada. Right? The Russians would roll their eyes and be like, really? Really? No, you don't triumph something unless they tried everything. Why did David face off with Goliath because the Philistines were like, here is our best. And if you can kill him, if you can beat this guy, we will give up because this is our best. This is our best fighter. This is the best we have. They didn't send out a five-year-old and say, if you can beat him, well then, shh, you're going to beat all of us. The enemy never comes out with the weakest 
won and says, I'm going to fight you, the enemy always comes after us with the worst. See, the enemy doesn't play fair. If we were to say, okay, Wesley's going to get into boxing and Wesley really wants to go out into the Olympics, we wouldn't say for his first fight, let's bring in Mike Tyson. Now, if you could fight him, we'll send you to the Olympics. They wouldn't do that, right? They would say, okay, he's 15, he weighs 160 pounds, we're going to get the same person in the same weight class. We make things fair. But Satan doesn't play by our rules. Satan doesn't try to make it fair. Satan doesn't say, well, you know what, you're kind of a powder puff. So it's just, it's just flag football, honey. No one's going to tackle you. No, you know what Satan does? He says, I'm coming after you, lady. I'm coming after you with everything. I'm going to tempt you with a thousand different things. I'm going to attack you in a thousand different ways. And I'm going to be as nasty as possible. Satan is not out here just trying to make you have a little thorn in your side. Satan is throwing every single thing at you. Why do most of us not feel it? Why did it feel just like a thorn in the side to Paul when Satan was trying to kill him and destroy him? Jesus told us that. He says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Only. That's his only goal. His goal is not to tease you. His goal is not to just come in there and, and insult you and bully you. He is coming to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. Jesus says, but I've come that you may have life and life to the full. How can we have life to the full when we have somebody trying to attack us? That's kind of like the Russian, or Russians going after the Ukraine, right? How could somebody be living in the Ukraine right now and, and not feel stressed? And not feel, not feel worried and not be wondering what's going on. They, they can't, right? There's an enemy actively going after them. So how, do, how are we living here on earth and not feeling totally stressed out because we have the Holy Spirit in us? Most of us, we have no idea what it's like to really live on earth. We think we're stressed. Man. Seri seriously, we think we're, we're, think we're stressed. You have no idea what people in Germany and what people in Africa and what people in South America live. We have absolutely no idea. Why? Because our forefathers came before and they blessed this nation and they prayed over this nation. And we have grandparents and great-grandparents and people that we don't even realize existed that have prayed for their generations coming before. And we live in a day and time in a society when you ask God, to help you and to do all these things, he's doing it. And we have this hedge of protection around us that we don't even realize is there. We have been covered with the blood of Jesus by people who have been praying over this city and this state and this country for hundreds of years. Why did Paul just feel like Satan was coming after him and I just felt like a thorn in his side? Because Paul had asked God to help him. Paul had the blood of Jesus over him. Paul had the Holy Spirit in him. The battle is not ours, it is the Lord's. And Paul had asked for God to help him. But that doesn't mean Satan has stopped trying. Satan is trying to steal from you. What does he steal? He steals your peace. He steals your joy. He steals your finances. He steals your mind. He steals your understanding. He steals your wisdom. He steals everything from you. Well, Mary, is Satan more powerful than God? You know, a lot of people have this, like, image in their head that, like, Satan's here and Jesus is here and they're fighting. And they just hope that one day Jesus wins. No, it was done. It was done. It's already been done. God is here. He created angels. He created mankind. He created animals. And guess what? He is over all of that. He casts Satan down. He is down here. And we all have free will. The angels have free will. We forget that. A third of them chose to go away from God. An absence of God is evil. So we are standing here and we've got free will. Do we call God into our lives? If you're calling God into your life, then you're asking him to fight your battles for you. 
And unlike all the people that Ukraine have asked to come in and help them, God actually comes. God sends, sends the angels down. God sends that Holy Spirit to fill you. I plead the blood of Jesus over this place. I plead the blood of Jesus over your homes. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. I love the Our Father prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know what my two favorite parts of that are? I mean, I should be thankful for the bread, you know, part I do like to eat once in a while. But I really get excited over the may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can pray for heaven on earth. I want heaven on earth. Don't look at me and say, what kind of car are you driving? They're driving those types of cars in heaven, and I want heaven on earth, right? Don't say, oh, Mary, you know, why do you do this or do that? We need, it's okay to ask God for things. Like, sometimes we're worried about, well, I don't know if I should have this, because some people don't have that. Let's pray we can all have something good, have the heart's desire. But my second part that I love in that was the lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Why do I need deliverance from the evil one? Because he wants to get me. Deliver me from him. Deliver me from the traps. Deliver me from his influence. Deliver me from his destruction. Lead me away from temptation. How do I make my life miserable here on earth by my things I do? Earthly sin brings earthly pain. If I take my paycheck, which I don't have one, but I'm just saying, let's say I had a paycheck. If I took that paycheck and I went and I spent it at the mall and then I didn't pay my electric bill, my electricity is going to be shut off. That was, right, an earthly action that was wrong. Then now I have an earthly consequence because of what I did. I need to pray and say, Lord, Deliver me from temptation. Help me to not do the things here on earth that cause myself harm. And then deliver me from the evil one that I have no control over who wants to cause me harm. I don't want you to walk around in life stuck in trauma mode. And when you think about the things that have happened to you, that that becomes our focus. Yes, when Christ was on the cross, he went through the trauma. But he turned that over to God and allowed his outcome to come over it. And now we look at it and it has become a triumph for us. The problem is, is when you're in it or when you see it coming, you don't necessarily feel the triumph, do you? When Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane looking forward as to what was going to happen to him in the next 24 hours, it wasn't like, okay, I'm so excited. I can't wait to get this over with because at the end it's going to be something great. He knew that. He had told the disciples that earlier. But as he's leading up to it, he's like, is there any other way? When he was on the cross, he was saying, why have you forsaken me? Even though he knew at the end of this, he would be back up in the heavens with God. Why? Because in our human form, we feel the, the issue we're in. We feel the issue we're in. I remind myself, when I'm going through like a medical procedure or something and I'm in pain, I keep reminding myself, pain is temporary, pain is temporary, pain is temporary, pain is temporary. But if you're not reminding yourself of that and you're laying there, you're like, ah, and you think it's going to last forever. Whatever trauma, whatever oppression Satan has tried to send your way, whatever negative thing that Satan is making you go through or has tried to put on you, in that moment, all you can feel is the pain. And a lot of times we forget to cry out to God. And I want you to remember right now in this moment that you can say, God, deliver me. Deliver me from the evil one. Lead me away from this temptation if it's you putting yourself in these situations. And ask for his help. 
Say, I release angels in the name of Jesus to come fight this battle because I am done. And I will not do this anymore. And I can't do this anymore. So God, you better do something now. It's okay to cry out to him. It's okay to ask him for help. Sometimes, right, we've learned this before, that is an expression of our faith. When we have faith that somebody can help us, we ask them to help us. If I don't believe that you can come out and jumpstart my car, I'm not going to ask you. But if I believe you can jumpstart my car, I'm going to say, hey, can you come help me jump my car? It's an act of faith to ask. Let's pray. Father God, Satan is trying to kill us. Satan is trying to destroy us. He's trying to destroy our mind. He's trying to destroy our workplace. He's trying to destroy our home life. He's trying to steal our joy. Deliver us from this evil. Thank you so much that we have been raised in a society that is blessed and that has had Christian foundation for so many years, but Satan has been battling hard against this culture and against our nation for a long time. Help us. We plead the blood of Jesus over our nation, over our towns, over our state, over our schools. Protect our children. Protect protect their mind, protect their understanding, protect us. We plead the blood of Jesus over our mind and over our body and over our finances and over our homes and over our relationships. Help us, Father God, not to walk around in this trauma that Satan is trying to put on us. Deliver us from the evil one. Help us to look back and say, this was a triumph. Satan tried everything. He tried to throw his worst shot at us. And guess what? God showed up, and I made it through. And if I can make it through that, if Jesus could make it through that on the cross, then we can make it through anything. Because you will never leave us nor forsake us. So be with us. Help us. Watch over us. And for every single person here that wants that prayer applied to their life, let's say amen. Amen? Amen. Well, I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope as we reflect back on Easter and we see that cross, we remember of the importance of it. And the Blessing Shop, it will be open if you need anything, and we will see you next Sunday. God bless.